Welcome back. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to uh, now have a uh, guest, David Noakes here, who's going to tell us about the wonders of GC Math. And I think this might be one of the most important enlightening things you've heard for a long time. So thank you very much for coming, David. Thank you, Clive. Right, well, GC Math is a human protein that all healthy people have inside them. Uh, it has 20 attacks on diseases that we know of at the moment. The immune system doesn't work without it, so, and of course the immune system can get rid of about 6,000 different diseases. So it's a very, very important protein in your body. However, if a disease comes along, and this includes cancer, um, it will try, the disease will try to prevent production of your, your own GCMAF. And it can do that if you are weak, if you have a down period, if you are stressed, if you've eaten too much sugar. You are giving the enzyme nagalase, which diseases send out, a chance to prevent your body making GCMAF. And it's spelt Golf Charlie Mike Alpha Foxtrot. So if that happens, um, you then lose your 20 attacks on various diseases. Six of GC Maths attacks are on cancer and you lose those. So if the disease that is taking down your GC Math happens to be cancer, if successful, the cancer will then explode and take over and you are usually dead in about five years. There are about a billion people, we estimate, in the world who do not have GCMAF inside them because of disease. So six billion people have it and about a billion don't. Obviously, as it's a human protein, as all of you can attest, it has no side effects. And you can attest to that because you have it inside you now. Um, so, what we do in our company, in our laboratory, we extract GC math. We can extract it from blood or milk, only obviously from healthy blood or milk, because unhealthy blood or milk won't have it. It's a 24 step process, and we end up with a billionth of a gram of GC math, which is what we administer a billionth of a gram. That is all you have inside you. So we then give this GC math, which we have to suspend in saline solution because it is such a small amount. We give this GC math, and there are five ways of getting it into the body to people with disease. And um, within minutes of getting the GC math back into your body, your attacks on the diseases start up again. And the last thing to start is your immune system. It takes three weeks for your immune system to be rebuilt. Um, it's stunning, uh, really, how many diseases can be cured by um, GC math. Autoimmune diseases. Uh, we had a chap come in over the moon. He's got. Um, he was in and out of A and E. He had all sorts of diseases related his autoimmune condition they've all gone now in I think it was three weeks um, it can cure herpes not all the time 50% of the time in about four months um, it's it, it cures ulcerated co colitis IBS most of the time diet is what makes the difference GC MAF starts life out in the body as GC protein. And GC protein is made in your liver, and the GC protein is made into GC MAF by your immune system. A B cell comes along and takes one of the three sugar cells, off sugar molecules, off the GC protein, and a T cell does the same, and you're now left with GC protein with one sugar molecule. And that is GC math. Yeah, 
Right, how, how the body makes GCMS. Right, so your, your liver makes GC protein. 3% of your blood is GC protein. And a T cell from the immune system comes along, takes one of the three sugar molecules off a GC protein molecule, and then a B cell does the same and now you have GC protein with only one sugar molecule on it, and that is GC MAF. But it only does that to a tiny amount of your GC protein because you only have a billionth of a gram of GC MAF inside your body. It's the most important billionth of a gram you can think of. Um, <clears throat> so, in the body, GCMAF and GC protein are part of the vitamin D pathway. In fact, one of the one of the names of GCMAF is vitamin D binding protein, which means GC protein. Vitamin D binding protein, macrophage activating factor. That is one of the names of GCMAF. It's actually a misnomer. Back when it was first discovered in 1990, 24 years ago. Um, they thought all it did was rebuild the immune system and activate macrophages, which is why it was called macrophage activating factor. But that's only one twentieth of what it does. And in the laboratory, our, we have a laboratory where we are doing research all the time. We have four eminent scientists. One of them's here today, Linda. And um, uh, we work with the University of Florence, who's also working on GC math. And that's how we got the number of um, actions of GCMAF up from 2 to 20, these two laboratories working together. Um, perhaps from, we got into GCMAF because we wanted to do something about cancer. And it was the hardest way to go in because it makes you very unpopular if you do anything with cancer. When we first started out, we were curing stage 2 cancers. Not all of them, but probably 80% of them. Very easily. And then we learnt about the protocol, what we call the protocol, the nutrition. And the protocol is very simple. It's at least two shots of GCMAF a week, 0.25 ml. That's actually two, two billions of a gram. That's putting in double what you need. And um, you have to take vitamin D because it's part of the vitamin D pathway and it, it, it only has 40% its power if you have low levels of vitamin D and pretty well everyone with cancer has got vitamin D down at the 20 level instead of the 60 nanograms per milliliter that they should have. So you've got to take vitamin D. You cannot eat sugar because Otto Warburg found out 40 years ago and wrote a paper on the very simple fact that um, cancer feeds and lives exclusively on sugar. And this is such a well-known fact in science, it's, it's totally indisputable. And yet you won't find one oncologist who will tell you to stop eating sugar. And that's why in the NHS they're giving people hot chocolates on the cancer wards for the sugar. Uh, you walk into the <laughs> NHS into a cancer ward and you look at the food they are yep. feeding them and you are absolutely horrified. Shocking. They have no idea what they are doing. Um, then, of course, carbohydrates in the body turn in, into sugar. So if you are fighting cancer, you must not eat carbohydrates or sugar. Um, you must eat meat, fish and vegetables because you need the lipids. Some, li some vegetables are more important than others. Asparagus and uh, broccoli spears seem to be the most important. And um, finally, the last part of the protocol is in the last stages of cancer, people get anorexia cachecha. That is to say, most people die of starvation because their bodies can no longer digest food. And we give people MAP proteins. And um, branched-chain amino acids are a similar thing, but the ones we use are pre-digested. And um, 
one pill is the equivalent of eating a whole chicken. And we can put on, in a dying person, we can put on three to four kilos a week in weight with these MAP proteins. But anyway, the final result of our adopting this protocol, which is, um, you know, the vitamin D, eat the right things, is that um, we now regularly cure terminal stage four cancer people if they have two months to live, providing they have not had too much chemotherapy, because if they've had too much chemotherapy, it wipes out their blood and immune system counts. So you're putting the GCMAF into the body, you're basically putting it into an empty void, it's got nothing to work with, and those people die. Um, but if you haven't had too much chemo, if you do the protocol, um, then if you are terminal stage 4 cancer with two months to live, you can confidently expect to be cancer free in a year. Now, we open three clinics. We can't do anything in England. In fact, we don't even like supplying GCMF in England because the laws are so bad. I must come back to that if you remind me. So we had to open our clinics in Germany and Switzerland. And we didn't really know what the law was in Switzerland. Um, so we asked people not to come unless they had at least three months to live because we didn't want to annoy the Swiss authorities by having people dying in our clinic. <laughs> well, five people um, um, effectively didn't tell us the truth and a arrived after the point at which their doctors predicted they would die. Of those two did die, the other three we sent home with 25% tumour reductions and put them on the, the, the path to become cancer free. So 60% success at the point of death is pretty good. Um, so in the clinics what we actually do is we, uh, we employ five doctors in the clinics and we use ultrasound effectively to squirt GC math onto the tumour inside the body and the ultrasound guides the syringe. We can also use the frequencies, uh, we know the frequency of GC math in Golaic um, so that we can drive it in the right direction and you can actually see it, you can actually see the Golaic, actually we only use Golaic in, in the um, clinics, you can see the Golaic being driven into the uh, tumours. Um, so, on the first week they get a 25% tumour reduction on average. The worst we've had is 8%, the best we've had is 40%. Um, and um, we, on the second week though of course, you've only got 75% of the tumour left. So we get rid of 25% of 75%. So on the third week, we haven't got rid of 75%, we've generally got rid of about 50-55%. And we send them home then to do the protocol. The home protocol, if you like, that I just explained to you. And you'd be amazed, something like 20-30% to 30 do not do the protocol at home. It's surprisingly successful with pancreatic cancer. Everyone thinks pancreatic cancer is a death sentence. Well, when we get pancreatic patients at the clinic, they get the same tumour reduction that everyone else does. And if they do the protocol, they too can expect to be cancer free in about six months, because we get rid of 50% of the cancer in the clinic, so they don't have to do a whole year, they only have to do about six months. We had one very nice chap called Paul, who has three little aeroplanes in the USA, and he's mid-70s, most of the people are 60s, 70s, 80s. And, um, and they're all terminal, we, pretty well everyone arrives as terminal. Um, he had pancreatic cancer and his pancreas had stopped producing insulin. The cancers had grown, the tumours had grown so large, he couldn't produce insulin anymore. So he arrived at the clinic with his medication, with his insulin medication, which he was injecting every day. He got a 25% tumour size reduction in his first week, 
And he also got the bonus that his pancreatic, um, his pancreas started producing insulin again. He threw his medication away. So he stayed for three or four weeks and uh, he got excellent reductions. And he's one of the people who then didn't bother to take it when he got home. He, he's still alive now, but uh, very, very disheartening for us. Um, I'll tell you a couple of interesting stories. We had this woman arrive who I will call Deirdre. And um, she walked through the front door, walked upstairs to the treatment room, sat down and died. And I maintain that's not three months. From downstairs to upstairs is not three months in my view. Anyway, she comes from Geordie Land, Newcastle. So the, her relatives are having a real go at our staff. We're going to close you down, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Meanwhile, our two nurses were beating the living daylights out of her dead body. And after 45 <laughs> seconds of this, they restarted her heart and breathing. Lynn over there got a 40% tumour reduction in her, in her in a week. She's back in Geordie land. She's doing the protocol absolutely ruthlessly and we expect her to become cancer free in the next six months. Yes, so I think Lynn can take all the credit for that. Come on, Lynn! <laughs> Yay! Um, and uh, so that just goes to illustrate that death is not necessarily a barrier to becoming cancer-free. <laughs> and um, one other case I'd like to tell you about is a woman who went to our Bayreuth clinic, which is in Bavaria, very close to the Czech border, northern Bavaria, very beautiful German countryside. And she arrived terminal stage four, expected to live three weeks, and she, her left breast was just solid, dripping tumour. There's no breast there, just ugly, horrible, raw tumour, which went right through into her armpit. Um, but rather surprisingly, she had no secondaries. That's all she had. She was going to die just from that one cancer. So they managed to get a tumour reduction of 40% in one week. GCMAF, one of the many things that GCMAF does is it isolates tumours. So it surrounded this odd shaped tumour with pus. They sent her in for surgery the following Wednesday. So she did a week in the clinic, finished on the Friday, went to surgery on Wednesday. They plucked the whole thing out. Surgeons plucked it out incredibly easily because it wasn't connected to anything anymore. And um, she became cancer free in 11 days flat. Now, that cancer will come back if she does not stay on GCMAF for another eight weeks. Um, she needs to be absolutely certain that the cancer has gone and that her own body's GCMAF has started up again. Um, so she needs to take, it's, it's a precaution if you like, she needs to do another eight weeks and if she does, That'll set her up for the rest of her life. Her GC map will start up again, and that cancer will never come back again. Um, I wonder if there's any other stories I should tell you. Well, we we have a number of people in Guernsey where we live. Um, we have a woman who was terminal stage. Um, terminal stage 4, well she had breast cancer, but terminal stage 4 because of her liver which was just full of cancer. Um, she came to see me and I said, right, well you will be cancer free in a year. Uh, she got this from three doctors, you know, she's got scans, she's got everything, you know, you are going to die in two months. She's heard that from three sets of doctors. So I said, right, well you will be cancer free in a year, but you do have to do exactly what I said. And she did. She did exactly what I told her. She did the diet. She did everything exactly right, except she did drink two bottles of red every day. Um, but red wine is actually good for you. 
and um, she was actually cancer free in 11 months. She had a full set of scans, her liver was normal, all the cancer had gone, she had a completely normal perfect liver and, and uh, she is still cancer free. In fact she goes down to our clinics and mentors in our clinics because it's good for people who are just starting the treatment to meet someone who's all already finished it. Um, another woman who mentors for us is Gail. She was terminal stage four with three months to live with ovarian cancer and secondaries to the lungs. The GCMF cleared out her lungs in three months flat. It halved the size of the ovarian and then it all went pear-shaped because she was stage four and this was back in the time when we only knew how to treat stage two. We didn't know about the diet and everything. And then she had a big bust up with her partner and the stress of that brought the whole lot back worse than it was in the beginning. But by that time we had learned about the diet. So then, then she had to be cured all over again. So it actually took her three years to end up cancer free. But she is completely cancer free and she mentors as well. Um, so I don't know what else to, to uh, tell you. Um, uh, yes, a question, Sean. Sure. Finding cancer, obviously, everyone, most people know cancer, tend to come back again and again. How do you resolve that? Well, the cancer? Right. Well, cancer only comes back again and again if you don't have GCMAF in your body. So, um, um, that is why we make people carry on for eight weeks after it appears they're cancer free make absolutely sure that all, all cancer has gone. So if you are going in for surgery, um, when a surgeon, surgeon cuts, he releases cancer cells which float around the body and cause secondaries that you die of two years later. But if you are on GCMF for three weeks before the operation and eight weeks afterwards, you will not get secondaries and surgery becomes very, very safe. If you have prostate cancer, um, uh, they do biopsies and again the needle is so big it breaks open cancer cells which float around the body and cause secondaries. If you're on GC math you can have biopsies perfectly safely. And I must tell you about another chap, um, uh, Peter, who arrived um, with terminal stage 4 prostate cancer Gleason 10. Now most people get to Gleason 9 and die. He actually made it to Gleason 10, probably because he's only 55 years old. And he had two or three weeks to live. His face was ghastly grey. Um, he had lymphedemia on his legs. The cancer was falling out of his calves. He had to wear body stockings to hold his calves together. Um, he couldn't really walk and he was in great pain. Um, after six weeks of GC math, he was walking an hour a day for fun after three months he had no symptoms of cancer whatsoever, no pain, nothing at all. The pain went at six weeks. Um, um, about a year, two months later we can see on ultrasound scans that he still has a bit of a tumour in his prostate. We can't be certain whether it's encapsulated or whether it's scar tissue but in any case it's still reducing at about 15% a month. So we expect him to be completely cancer free in about, um, well, another eight months perhaps. So he may be 20 months from start to finish, but then he was an exceptionally um, difficult case. We always cure prostate cancer, it's a piece of cake. Um, we, we always cure lung and breast cancer, which are very easy. Um, bowel cancer is more difficult and um, uh, bone metastasis are more, uh, take longer. Yes? What about brain cancer? Um, we were a little worried with brain cancer because what the immune system does is it firstly swells and ex inflames tumours as the first part of attacking them. Well that can give you intracranial pressure. Now. If you whack a large dose of GCMAF in, its other attacks often reduce the tumour size in the brain. Um, so that when 
the immune system comes along a few weeks later and has a go, it's, it's too late. The tumor's already shrunk. Works very, very well with cyber knife surgery because with the surgery you can reduce the size of the tumour and then you really don't care whether the GCMF swells the tumour because you've got all that extra space there. Oh, and, and we do that in our clinic, by the way, very successfully. We, we treat brain cancers in our clinic quite confidently now. Uh, brain degenerative. Mm. Right, um, we actually found 10 of the things that GCMath does, 10 of its actions, and three of them are on the brain. It reactivates um, microglia cells in the brain, and, with, and it has beneficial effects on neur neurons, and between those two it actually creates new neurons. So. We predicted in the paper we wrote that it would be good for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, and uh, what's the other one? My, my father's got progressive cerebral palsy. MS. Yeah. Right. It's a new one. Well, clearly. Okay. Well, it's 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 worth trying it. We just can't say. Yeah. I yeah. I think he he's he'd be up for guinea pig and dad. He's kind mm. of open to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. I have absolutely no idea whether it works, but I've whether it will work. But I've stopped saying adamantly it will not work because I've been proved wrong too often. So we had this father, Nigel, whose two children have LMBBS, and only 300 people in England have got it. And basically, that is like chronic fatigue syndrome in that you feel like death, you can't get out of bed, 18 hours a day in bed, and. Um, you can't hold a job down. But in this case, you go blind at the age of 25 and you die at the age of 40. So it's a pretty nasty thing to have. So his two children were, son and daughter, were hopelessly depressed. And um, in two months, all the symptoms of LMBBS had left both of them. And absolutely incredibly, their opticians reported that their maculas were growing back their eyesight is improving and at the rate they're going they're going to be able to drive in a year. We, we just mentioned Parkinson's. I know that the disease my dad's got is a parking, mm. no, Parkinson's disease. Mm. Parkinson's mm. Disease. It's part of the Parkinson's family. Yeah. yeah. So what Im improvements did you see with someone who had Parkinson's? Well this is the trouble. We really got into this the wrong way around. We got into it because we wanted to help people with cancer. Yeah. And of course, we are upsetting incredibly powerful chemotherapy pharmaceutical companies, and there have been seven attempts to close us down as a result. If we had gone in another way, perhaps the way you're suggesting, we would have had a much quieter ride. Um, but because we went in with cancer, no one is looking at us for Parkinson's or this sort of stuff, so we don't have patients. For that. Okay. See me afterwards. Okay. <laughs> I don't think it would be successful with motor neuron disease. Um, we have 8,000 patients. About 3,500 of them are autistic kids. Um, we improve 85% of autistic kids. 25% um, of them um, become free of autism and they go back to normal school. Um, uh, yes, I think so, yes. Yeah. Um, so, but in our clinics, uh, and actually the figures with ME are somewhat better than that, we have this brilliant group, the Chester ME Self Help Group near Liverpool run by these two incredibly bright women who have a file that thick on every one of their members and we now we know for a fact that we 85% cure 70% of people with ME CFS um, and that would have been a good way to get in but we had no idea it was going to do this at the beginning 
Um, hmm? Well, yeah, that's not a bad idea actually. Close everything down and start up again. And don't tell anyone that it, it's good for cancer. Mm. Word of mouth. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we've got 8,000 patients. Um, and I would think then probably two and a half thousand are cancer, quite a lot are ME, um, and then it's scattered over all sorts of things. Um, we had a taxi driver who'd got ulcerated colitis, and he'd be driving along in the, with passengers, be completely unable to control his bowels and have these nasty accidents in front of passengers. Um, well, he's now got complete control of his bowels, took him about one month, and um, his ulcerated colitis is just disappearing every day. Um, my programmer had Crohn's disease, and um, uh, so we put him on GCMF, and we were sending it. We've been sending it to him for uh, about 14 months, and to my fury, we found out that actually he was cured six months ago, and he hadn't bothered to tell us. <laughs> Um, and we do have enormous problems with feedback. Everyone ticks a box. They go to the website, they fill out the form with their name and address and tell us what they've got and then they tick a box. Um, I promise to give feedback and 80% don't. And even my own programmer won't give me feedback. So it's a bit of a struggle getting the data together. We have perfect feedback in two places. That is Guernsey, where we live. Hmm? We'll get the feedback. <laughs> so in, it's only a few phone calls. It, it, exactly. So in Guernsey, we have perfect feedback. We have 120 patients in Guernsey, and they are the only ones who come to our house. And we say, have you done the 10,000 IU of vitamin D today? Did you take your two shots? We make absolutely certain they do the full protocol. And not only is the feedback best in Guernsey, but the results are best in Guernsey because we force them to do the protocol. And we, we, do, we do have some quite astonishing results. It is also a upsetting thing to be doing because we get people come in with terminal stage 4 cancer who've had chemotherapy we ask to see their bloods, and when we see their bloods, we know whether they're going to live or die. If they've had too much chemotherapy, the bloods will be awful, and we can't tell them they're going to die. We have to tell them, oh yeah, this is definitely going to work, because, you know, Lynn's actually saved one of these. Um, see, we, we can't tell them you're going to die, because actually, one in 20 of them won't. But we had a 17-year-old boy die who'd been chemoed to death, literally chemoed to death. Devastating for us. Devastating for Lynn. And, you know, we haven't... This is happening all the time. Um, so when should you use chemotherapy? May I have an answer to that question, Never. please? Yeah. Is it 0.3% in the oncology, 3% uh, doesn't so 97 uh, you're absolutely right. It's actually chemotherapy is supposed to contribute to the improvements to uh, in 2.3 percent of cases. Yeah. yeah. Um, but placebos do better than that. Yes, yes placebos do what better than that. Absolutely. Sorry. What about the, the radiation, radiotherapy, tablets, and stuff? Um, cyber knives can be good. Mainly, radiation just destroys the person, just as chemotherapy does. But cyber knives is very targeted and it's very good for the brain. Um, but that's the only place I would use it. But you're absolutely right, you should never use chemotherapy. You'll always bump into it some, well, I took chemotherapy, saved my life. Well, okay, but actually, you'd have done better just to have done the diet. If chemotherapy saved you, you'd have been a lot better off with the diet, would have, would have had better effects and no side effects. So there's no time when chemotherapy is indicated. But oncologists tell you, that when they arrive, they lie to you, that the only options are slash poison burn, chemotherapy, um, radiotherapy and surgery. They lie. 
and they say, no, there is nothing else. Absolute lies. There are half a dozen treatments for cancer which have been used successfully in the last hundred years um, that have saved thousands and thousands of people. You've probably heard of Isayak. Oh, yeah, Isayak tea. Yeah, so what happened with Isayak is American Indians would watch animals that had cancer and see which herbs they ate. And they remembered those herbs because they didn't write anything down and that became the recipe. And that was given to a nurse called Rene Case. Um, and they say his case backwards. And she was curing people with, ca with cancer in Toronto, Canada. And the town that she lived in, which was called Bracegirdle or something, gave her a hospital for a dollar a year and she had Americans pouring over the border in ambulances and a few, few months later they'd be driving back in their cars. She was curing thousands. Well, of course that couldn't be allowed. The chemotherapy pharmaceutical mob had a word with the, um, the, the, uh, the borough council and got the hospital withdrawn from her and she had to close down. It's a very evil world out there. Yes, yeah. Um, so, the, um, the power of the pharmaceuticals is stunning. They have about a, a turnover of 795 billion, that's half the uh, all, uh, dollars in the USA, mostly in the USA, it's half the uh, GNP of England. And um, um, their men sit on the boards of British lawmaking bodies and they have changed the law in Britain so that only their product is allowed to be prescribed by doctors. Doctors are only allowed to prescribe the poison of chemotherapy. That's the only drug they're allowed. Why don't doctors say that? Doctors are ruthlessly controlled by their professional bodies who are stunningly corrupt and if they step out of line they are struck off ruthlessly. Yes, Richard. Well, what would the cost of um, someone that had cancer at home taking your product? What would the cost be roughly? Um, well, a vial is 450 euros. I mean, we, we don't do anything in England. The laws are so bad in England, we do nothing here at all. So it's all done overseas. Uh, so it's, it's for, well, Switzerland, Germany, mainly. But the, well, we don't do anything in Guernsey. We're not allowed to do anything there. Okay, you did the eight-week follow-up. Yeah, we did the follow-up. We do the admin in Guernsey. So it's 450 a vial, which does eight shots. 450 euros. Two shots a week. One shot a week. Well, as part of the research we did, we found out that the its other four actions on cancer. Um, um, have a half-life of only three days, so we now say take two shots a week. But if you are terminal stage for cancer, the more the better, so take a mill a day. But in our clinics we actually give two mill a day because different people respond, you know, some are brilliant responders and need very small amounts, and some are awful responders and need huge amounts. Well, to be belt and braces we give everyone huge amounts because we, we desperately want to send them home with a 25% tumour reduction, so we don't care what it costs in terms of GCMF, we just make sure they get the results. Um, so yes, this $795 billion chemotherapy mob, their lobby is worth a billion dollars. They control Cancer Research UK, their men sit on its board, and they actually, Cancer Research UK actually has a wholly dishonest web page um, rubbishing GC Math. And in it they say that um, it all depends on just one scientist. I'm sorry, there are 180 scientists who've written research papers on GC Math and they are lying. Simple, straightforward fraud. And I consider that the Cancer Research charity is a huge fraud because the cure for cancer was discovered 24 years ago and they're still raising half a billion a year, fraudulently, in donations. 
Sorry? Yeah. 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 I mean, if Cancer Research UK was in the least bit interested in getting rid of cancer, it would go back to one of the six proven cancer cures that have come out of the last hundred years. You know, just diet will stop stage three cancer in its tracks. Diet will cure stage two cancer. Why aren't they pushing that? They don't, not even slightly. Why aren't they pushing a SAIAC? Why aren't they pushing GC math? Because they are the front end of the chemotherapy companies. And Macmillan, Macmillan is just the same. Two very evil charities. And then there's another charity, so-called charity, Anti-Cancer Fund, the Anti-Cancer Fund. They are going around trying to get research papers on GC math uh, retracted. And unfortunately, it's rather easy to do because to put a, a research paper up, you have to have um, it, you have to have it peer reviewed by other scientists. But to take a research paper down, you've just got to convince the ad admin clerk that this is a bad paper, and the admin clerk will take it down. It doesn't go to peer review, so they've already successfully and completely fraudulently, with totally fraudulent arguments, and one of the three doctors involved is actually marketing a, uh, a competing product which they conceal in their submissions. But they have, they, they took one down without us noticing. It was all done behind our backs, no one knew. The other two, we seem to have stopped them. But, you know, they just, one of them was ours. We made the front page of Onco Immunology uh, Journal. These are all very prestigious scientific journals. And we've actually written 22 research papers of our own one of which is in the top 5% most read research papers of all time. So we've got four very brilliant scientists headed up by Professor Marco Ruggiero, MD, and um, uh, we, are, we put out about one research paper a month. Our research paper on the 2nd of January this year, first one, found the place in the human brain where autism resides. So in most people, this part of the brain, which is in the subapcanoid space, is a millimetre thick. In autistic kids, it's 3.4 millimetres thick. So you can actually watch a child's autism grow, or, or, or you, you have a perfect way of measuring autism for the first time in autism's history. And um, um, another thing that happened was um, Professor Marco Ruggiero's mother had uh, breast cancer um, and she had it all tested at a, at a hospital in Italy and they've got all the numbers, absolutely everything, you know, terminal stage four, it's that you know. so Marco says we better come to my clinic for three weeks because he was the first doctor in our first clinic and, um, and uh, he got a 40% tumour reduction, the whole thing was surrounded by pus, they just plucked it out, Easy. It, was, it had actually invaded the pectoral muscle, you know, but it had come back out of the pectoral muscle while on Golaic, which is our own version of GC math, which is a bit more powerful. And um, she went back to the hospital, now she had tested positive for the HER2 oncogene. Do you know what an oncogene is? Well, in your DNA you have genes, and sometimes the genes go bad, they mutate and become an oncogene, which is a gene that generates cancer cells. You can't turn these things off, but once you've cured cancer, um, your body, your, all of us make about 10,000 to 100,000 cancer cells a day, and the GCMAF in our bodies gets rid of them. So you can't turn the onto oncogene off, her to oncogene off, but your body, your G, the GCMF in your body, it doesn't matter, it'll keep killing the cells for the rest of your life in a normal way. However, when they got her back to the hospital and they tested her again, the go leg had turned off the HER2 oncogene, and this is the first time it has been done in a human body in the history of mankind. They've done it in the lab before, but they've never done it in a human body. 
So what's Golaic? Well, it's what we use most of the time. It's basically GC math with oleic acid, and um, we, um, uh, we we put this molecule together because it's 25% more powerful in the human body than straight GC math, and it um, um, oleic acid, of course, you find in olive oil and in the human body. And it's more robust, so you can nebulize with it and you can make suppositories out of it, which you can't with straightforward GC math. Um, I think I should just perhaps ask if there are any questions. So, is there anything that you can increase your GC math in your body other than? Um, <coughs> no, we don't know a way that can be done yet. Could you explain um, the results with kidneys? Kidney oh. failure. Yeah. So when we first started out, we had this chap from Sardinia. And he had everything under the sun, EBV, hepatitis B, and uh, chronic cirrhosis of the liver. It took a year to cure his hepatitis B. He was only taking 0.25 ml a week, and we didn't know about the diet then. We can probably do it a lot quicker now. It took him 16 months to be completely cured of chronic cirrhosis of the liver. <coughs> 